Zombie Apocalypse. <laughs> Do you want to achieve your desired PTE score but not getting it even after number of attempts? Join our online PTE course, where you can get valuable tips and strategies by experts. Also, you will be provided with new and updated bulk practice material with rigorous practice sessions and feedback. For more details, contact on given WhatsApp number, also you can follow us on Facebook and Telegram. Now that story's been scotched as only part of contingency planning, but it was a symptom of, of the dramatic turns of a turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother, considering that the vast majority of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered Murray, something many of us outside the state may not have quite realised. Is their predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? Lawrence Stephen Lowry. Lawrence Stephen Lowry, RBS, RA, was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Penn, Liberty, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of Northwest England in the mid 20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his urban landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits, and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death. In animals, a movement is coordinated by a cluster of neurons in the spinal cord called the central patterns generator, CPG, produces signals that drive muscles to contract rhythmically in a way that produces running or walking, depending on the pattern of pulses. A simple signal from the brain instructs the CPG to switch between different modes, such as going from a standstill to walking. That brings us to the CEO's second duty, building everyone, or more accurately, building the senior team. All the executives report to the CEO, so it's the CEO's job to hire, fire, and manage the executive team. From coaching CEOs, I actually think this is the most important skill of all, because when a CEO hires an excellent senior team, that team can keep the company running. When a CEO hire a poor senior team, the CEO is up spending all of their time trying to do with the team and not nearly enough time trying to do with other elements of their job. The senior team can, and often does, 
develop the strategy for the company. But ultimately, it's always the CEO who has the final go, no go decision on strategy. Many different types of barcode scanning machines exist, but they all work on the same fundamental principles. They all use the intensity of light reflected from a series of black and white stripes to tell a computer what code it is seeing. White stripes reflect light very well, while black stripes reflect hardly any light at all. The barcode scanner shines light sequentially across the barcode simultaneously detecting and recording the pattern of reflected and non-reflected light. The scanner then translates this pattern into an electrical signal that the computer can understand. All scanners must include computer software to interpret the barcode once it's been entered. This simple principle has transformed the way we are able to manipulate data and the way in which many businesses handle record keeping. Candace Galen is based at the University of Missouri in Columbia. And being a biologist, she thought, why not use this astronomical phenomenon to study a biological one? Specifically, as the skies darkened, would daytime pollinators like bumblebees and honeybees call it quits? What better activity during an eclipse than to go out with a recorder and record the bees? So. Galen asked 400 citizen scientists, including young students, to place audio recorders in 16 flower patches along the path of totality in Oregon, Idaho, and Missouri. When they analyzed the audio, they found that during partial eclipse, bee buzzing continued. But when totality hit, the bees went silent and only the conversational buzz of human observers could be heard. Then, as the moon passed and the sun again lit up the sky, the bees regained their buzz. The ocean has been getting bluer, according to a study published in the journal Nature. But that's not really good news for the planet. It means that the plants that give the ocean its green tint aren't doing well. Scientists say that's because the ocean has been getting warmer. For many years, the favorite horror story about abrupt climate change was that a shift in ocean currents could radically cool Europe's climate. These currents, called the overturning circulation, bring warm water and warm temperatures north from the equator to Europe. Susan Luger, an oceanographer at Duke University, says scientists have long worried that this ocean circulation 
could be disrupted. What is nanotechnology? Well, a report that was put together by a combination of the Royal Society and the Royal Academy of Engineering that came out last summer identified two topics. Nanoscience is the study of phenomenon and the manipulation of materials at atomic, molecular, and macromolecular scales, where properties differ significantly from those as a larger scale. Nanotechnologies are the design, characterization, production, and application of structures, devices, and systems by controlling shape and size at the nanometer scale. So I'll talk a little bit more in a moment about what a nanometer is. But loosely speaking, people think of nanotechnologies as being a sort of a hundred nanometers or less. So a virus is something that you can't see by normal light microscopy. You need very advanced techniques for electron microscopy to see it. But that virus is not able to reproduce itself without a host. And us, as human beings, are made up of lots of different cell types. And we are interested in understanding at the molecular level how that virus infects the liver and why does it infect the liver and it doesn't infect the heart, or it doesn't infect other tissues. <clears throat> Morality and climate change. Financial markets swung wildly yesterday in frenzied trading market by further selling of equities and fears about an unraveling of the global carry trade. At the same time, trading in the European credit markets in London was exceptionally heavy as traders frantically reassessed their appetite for risk, prompting wild swings in the prices of the key derivatives. It was the third day of frenetic activity in the European credit markets suggesting that equity market swings were prompting a wider repositioning of investors in a host of asset classes. For all his fame and celebration, William Shakespeare remains a mysterious figure with regards to personal history. There are just two primary sources for information on the Bard, his works and various legal and church documents that have survived from Elizabethan times. Naturally, there are many gaps in this body of information, which tells us little about Shakespeare the man.
There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in a country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas-powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there's good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads? Our guest today will help answer that. Social harm originates out of a series of debates within criminology about the narrowness of the definition of crime, that essentially, focuses on individual acts of harm, things like interpersonal violence, theft, so on and so forth. So the idea of social harm originally was to expand that notion of harm to encompass the harms that organizations cause that nation-states cause. But latterly the idea of social harm really now transcends criminology so there are a group of writers who think that, and I would include myself there, that actually there's something to social harm that could be very useful in terms of trying to understand the harms that occur within society, to produce an objective and well-rounded analyses of harm. Green chemistry is a concept designed to develop technologies which allow chemistry to be practiced with minimal damage to the environment, or in an environmentally compatible way, and it's meant to cover both chemical processes and chemical products. The center was set up about seven or eight years ago. And the idea was to provide a hub of activities that covered fundamental research work, international collaboration, but also educational development on public understanding of the project as well, and also networking so we network out to well over 1,000 people around the globe. What I'm trying to understand, and what other colleagues of mine are trying to understand, is how we moved from that cold climate condition to the warm climate condition that we enjoy today. We know from ice core research that the transition from these cold conditions to warm conditions wasn't smooth, as you might predict, from the slow increase in solar radia radiation. And we know this from ice cores, because if you drill down into ice, you find annual bands of ice. And you can see this in the iceberg. You can see those blue-white layers. Gases are trapped in the ice cores, so we can measure CO2. That's why we know CO2 was lower in the past. And the chemistry of the ice also tells us about temperature in the polar regions. Perhaps you've seen pictures of the large array of, you know, those radio telescopes in New Mexico, scanning the skies for intelligent life in the movie Contact well radiant astronomers have caused to celebrate the first phase of a giant new radio telescope array went operational in Northern California, it's going to help astronomers study things like black holes and dark galaxies. All the while scanning the stars for, who knows, radio signals coming from somewhere else in the universe. Maybe E.T. is phoning home.
Interesting sound. I would have guessed a Wild West performer was practicing with a bullwhip while also vacuuming. But no, that sound is apparently produced by the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights. Since 2000, researchers at Finland's Aalto University have been collecting audio as part of what's called the Aurora Acoustics Project. Folk tales had long held that the lights also produce odd sounds, but the claims were hard to prove. And some researchers thought that any noises produced by the energetic particles that cause the light show would be far too high in the sky to be heard on the ground. But the latest results indicate that at least some sounds are produced very close to the ground. A setup of three ground-based microphones allowed researchers to estimate that the sounds occur perhaps just 70 meters up. The results were just presented at the International Congress on Sound and Vibration in Vilnius, Lithuania. More information about the sounds of the Northern Lights could lead to a more complete understanding of the phenomenon. So if you see an aurora, keep your ears open. These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project. Rebuilding carbon-rich agriculture soils is the only real productive, permanent solution to taking excess carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. She's frustrated that scientists and politicians don't see the same opportunities she sees. This year, Australia will emit just over 600 million tons of carbon. We can sequester 685 million tons of carbon by increasing soil carbon by half a percent on only 2% of the farms. If we increased it on all of the farms, we could sequester the whole world's emissions of carbon. Why do we need more entrepreneurs right now? The entrepreneurs who create and run our businesses, who play by the rules, are in fact critical to our success as a nation. We need them especially today. Business, not government, will end this recession. Government must help by creating fair rules, sound monetary policy, and by protecting our fellow citizens in periods when they are jobless. We have to make way for the new entrepreneurial firms that will push us to frontiers of innovation.
To begin with, you should be standing in the main floor of the British Library. British Library situated in the Euston Road next to some pipe crustacean press, in the foyer to the left of the information desk. It was a large white staircase. Follow this up towards the gallery at the top of the stairs pause and look to your left for attention. This is Robert Cotton, born in 1570, and died in 1631. Cotton was a member of Parliament but he's mainly known as a great antiquarian collector of manuscripts. It is the covenant we have a great depth and the survival of many English manuscripts. Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honor. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books, useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, classic Latin. So what's so new about it? The effect of the first difference is, on the one hand, to refine and enlarge the public views by passing them through the medium of a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may be discerned the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Under such a regulation, it may well happen that the public voice pronounced by the representatives of the people will be more consonant to the public good than if pronounced by the people themselves, convened for the purpose. Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorized users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go 
when pursuing a partner. I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25 percent more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not. They're they're also、um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. Well, in 2004, we integrated ticketing in Southeast Queensland, so we introduced a paper、uh, ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in Southeast Queensland, so bus, train, and ferry. And the second stage of、uh, integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card, and the smart card will enable people to store value,、uh, so to, to put、uh, value on the card and then to use the card for travelling around the system. For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary. And vehicles clumped together at one point on the track, but the jam spread backward around the track like a shock wave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real-life jams move backward at about the same speed. Families are always related to the economy, the politics, the culture of the society. In herding societies, young people go out when they're ten or twelve years old, and they hang out with the sheep or the goats or whatever the herd is. That produces a kind of a loose bond between the pre-adolescents and their parents. In industrial societies, we tend to keep kids in school for longer, and then college is that point when they might break, or after college. Depending on what they're doing, in agrarian societies, families have lots of kids and put them to work. They structure themselves as large families and put them all together in one home. The main point is that families are not separate from the society. Families and the economy and the politics are all wrapped up all together.